good afternoon and welcome to the next session of this uh, this two-day event on uh, on on basically trying to have some thoughts on the next few years on the on the EU. And we will very much continue the discussion actually from the previous panelists. But this time we will we will we will really focus on the economic recovery and in particular on the sustainable economic recovery um, post the coronavirus. I am joined by four very distinguished guests, uh, whom I will introduce uh, uh, very briefly, and then I will ask them to give me uh, a small summary, let us say a three-minute summary of initial remarks. Uh, their first thoughts on the issue of how do we achieve um, a recovery. So uh, let me first introduce uh, the panelists. Uh, Céline uh, Goya, who is the, the head of the Recovery and Resilient Task Force of the European Commission. Luis de Mello, who is the Director of Policy Studies at the Economics Department of the OECD. Um, Jakob van Kiergaard, who is a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. And Lucille Smith, who is the Vice President of uh, Fabrique Ecologique. Why don't I start with you, uh, Celine? your first thoughts, or let's say no more than three minutes. You are charged with a very big task of implementing the Recovery and Resilience uh, New Generation EU Fund. What are your first thoughts on how to achieve a sustainable economic recovery? So good, uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very sorry that the, uh, the, the camera doesn't seem to be uh, possible to, to activate. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll speak just, uh, just like this. Uh, <laughs> The, um, the, the we, we see the recovery and, and resilience facility as a key uh, instrument uh, for, for for delivering on the on, on, on the ambition of having a sustainable uh, recovery. Uh, it is a, an, an, an amazingly large facility, 672 billion to be deployed over the next the next six years. And to access the funds, the member states will have to submit recovery and resilience plans describing in detail reforms and investments that they intend to carry out uh, with uh, with these funds while the legal basis is still being discussed between the parliament and uh, and, and the council in trilogues uh, very intensively these days uh, we already know uh, know now that it will be an essential instrument for sustainable recovery through two main levers the first one is the focus of the spending on uh, on on climate and 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 possibly also on biodiversity. We have uh, as a, as a result of the council and negotiations a minimum of 37 percent of the overall expenditure from the facility that will have to be devoted to, to the climate, and spending on biodiversity will come on top of this uh, 37 percent. But also very importantly. The do no significant harm principle will apply to the entire spending of the of the facility. So this should allow us to avoid the the, the mistakes that we have seen following the uh, financial crisis, where a lot of the recovery went through uh, investment in polluting sectors, investment uh, in, uh, in in fossil fuel. Here, to through this do no significant harm principle, we we are able to ensure that not a single euro would go uh, to polluting uh, to polluting technologies. This will apply to all the member states, uh, obviously, and we already see, uh, you know, discussions with the member states that they do have very strong green uh, green components. And this is not only motivated by the green ambitions they they share, but also because it makes sense from an economic and social point of view. Let me take uh, the, the most obvious example: the renovation of buildings. We know that buildings are responsible for a very large share of uh, of, of emissions, uh, but renovation of building is labor intensive. It is relatively quick to put in place. It uh, triggers a lot of jobs for local SMEs. And once buildings are renovated, uh, they quick start reducing energy poverty. So you have here the, the ideal combination of something that is good for recovery, good for good for growth, and at the same time a key element of, of sustainability. And we see uh, similar examples of uh, of investment for sustainable mobility, renewables, or, or hydrogen. This is why uh, I think that the, this uh, this facility is, is is really a a fantastic tool to make sure that we don't go back to where we were before the pandemic, but that we use this crisis as a, as an opportunity uh, to really transform deeply our economy and make them more sustainable and 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 greener. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Celine. That was very interesting. I'm sure you will come back to some of the details uh, that uh, that you mentioned. Uh, why don't I pass on to um, uh, Luis? Uh, Luis, you are you're working closer to the data. What do we learn from the recent economic data? Where where are we now, and where are we going? 
Thank, thank, thank you very much, Maria. I apologize. I cannot switch my camera on for some technical reason. But um, let me just make uh, make the point that um, you know this crisis has been uh, dramatic uh, on economies and societies. We are seeing that uh, lots of the uh, impacts that we saw uh, earlier on uh, this year um, have dissipated. Now we have some good news related to the development of a vaccine and treatment. So those are all very good, uh, um, encouraging signs that basically can uh, reduce the uncertainty that we are seeing uh, as, a, as a key factor behind uh, the, this drain of, 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 of the energy um, in the outlook moving forward. Uh, we are also seeing that uh, some of the uh, impacts that we are seeing associated with this crisis will have longer term consequences. Uh, the the so-called scarring effects that are related to people staying in longer term unemployment, uh, uh, enterprises uh, uh, going bankrupt. Uh, so um, all uh, uh, longer term consequences uh, that will have uh, an impact on our potential to growth, to grow moving forward. We are also seeing, since you asked directly about the numbers, uh, beyond activity, we are seeing that governments are doing a lot to support uh, the, the recovery. And we see this as an opportunity uh, to take action in a way that can foster a shift from fossil fuels to renewables and then to limit the long-term uh, threat from, from climate change. I just wanted to make in this uh, um, introductory opportunity three points about that. One is that many governments have included the green recovery measures in their fiscal stimulus packages, in their investment programs. But we also see that these have typically accounted for only a very small share of the overall support provided. So the balance between green and non-green spending is relatively unfavorable in the composition of what governments are providing uh, in terms of, uh, of stimulus uh, right now. Another point that is also important to make is that some of the support actions that are being deployed may actually have a negative effect uh, on, on environmental outcomes. Uh, for instance, uh, support for uh, companies in emissions uh, intensive sectors such as airlines, uh, or also uh, the reduction of waivers of environmental taxes, uh, fees and charges uh, that, uh, that are in place. Those are part uh, of uh, the, uh, uh, the stimulus packages that we see in some countries. And the third point, and I'll stop here, Maria, is that uh, let's not forget that uh, fossil fuel prices are now substantially lower than they were expected to be a year ago. And that's essentially as a result of the crisis. It's normal. We see in periods of recession that there is a reduction in fossil fuel prices. But the problem is that that reduces incentives for investment in technologies that can facilitate the carbon transition. So those three points about the composition of stimulus, the effect prices on, on, on fossil fuel um, uh, prices, and some of the measures that can actually have a negative impact on environmental outcomes, uh, these are important features that we are seeing at the moment. Thank you very much, Luis. That was uh, really excellent. Uh, before I continue, let me just uh, uh, remind our audience that you are welcome to ask questions via your chat. I already see that there are very interesting questions coming in. Uh, but also remind you that we are running a server, which we are uh, you are very welcome to participate in by going to the Slido application and just typing the conference code uh, hashtag ESPAS. Uh, we will give you the results of uh, the um, the this uh, very interesting uh, survey later on in our conversation um so luis i i was delighted because you really actually uh, <laughs> brought in the the conflicts of of the the need to save the green economy uh, on the one side to green to save the economy on the one side but also make sure that it remains green uh, and i think we'll come back to this issue um but let me bring my, my other two guests uh, to the conversation jacob can i perhaps ask you a question which goes uh, in the direction of the other big thing that is going on in the economy, that is the digitization. Um, and, and, you know, do you think that there is a scenario where uh, digitization can benefit society as a whole? Or do you think that there is the cause of an increasing inequality and division? 
Yeah, I think I think there are basically two aspects of that. First of all, of course, um, the role. I mean, there's no doubt that the you know the pandemic and the shutdowns, etc., have accelerated existing trends with regards to the shift to uh, you know online delivery vehicles like the one we're using right now. Uh, but I think so. One question is: Will uh, the pandemic lead to lasting shifts in consumer preferences? So that we will continue to have, uh, you know, conferences online, relative, you know, rather than in person. Uh, if that's the case, well, obviously, digitalization will have greatly been accelerated by the pandemic. I'm personally skeptical about that. Uh, in the sort of more broad services sector office uh, environment, I think, uh, you know, we will rediscover soon with vaccines the, uh, you know, value of interpersonal contact. Um, and then the other issue uh, uh, that actually, in my opinion, certainly predates the pandemic, uh, is this issue of digitalization and the competition policy uh, monop the natural monopolies of big data. Uh, because I think, you know, it's very clear that if you look at uh, the, the sort of big, uh, you know, typically right now, American tech companies, uh, that tend to have, based on their social media and online presence, have more or less of a monopoly on big data, and therefore the ability to you know rely on machine uh, learning algorithms and artificial intelligence to predict consumer behavior and all of that. Uh, these companies have done phenomenally well from the pandemic, but they did phenomenally well before the pandemic because already before the pandemic they had uh, this preferred access to these uh, big data sets. Now that isn't going to last. Uh, I think 5G, the rollout of 5G networks will mean that big data will not just be something we have in online search or you know online commerce. Uh, it will be something that uh, relates to every sector of the economy, but there will be the potential for uh, control of sectoral data everywhere in the economy, basically, ironically, expanding the risk of these monopolistic uh, behaviors and actual monopolies across uh, our entire economies. So the real question for whether or not digitalization can power a broad-based shared economic growth is you've got to democratize or spread out the access to this data. Uh, and my view is that the best way to do that is to treat, you know, access to a big data sets as essentially a little bit like a patent, uh, meaning that you reward firms uh, for collecting this big data, and you may even give them a monopoly access to it for, you know, a short period of time. But then after that, you also compel them to make these big data sets available to the wider public uh, so that everyone can share from the insights, uh, which of course, in a European economy where small and medium sized businesses typically dominate, which have very little capability of themselves gathering such large data sets, they would still be able to benefit from it. Uh, so I think there are uh, opportunities to make uh, digitalization less centralizing, but we got to get uh, data sharing right. And uh, that's really the big question. Thank you very much, Jacob. That's, uh, that's very great. But do you think that, I mean, I cannot, I cannot uh, resist the temptation of asking you, do you think that can improve the, the distribution elements or, or is, it, is that going to remain an issue? I mean, the access for all and the inequality resulting from that is something that can improve? From what you just described, or is it a challenge that we need to move, they need to meet with other means? No, I mean, I, I think it's a necessary but not sufficient uh, issue uh, because I think it is absolutely necessary if we want to prevent uh, digital or, or big data natural monopolies from emerging in every sector of the economy, uh, based basically, you know, meaning that you will have, you know, one Amazon or one Google pretty much in every sector. Uh, that doesn't, of course, mean that you don't need activist, progressive taxation, redistributive policies, sort of traditional redistributive policies. Uh, and of course, also, uh, uh, if you like, fairer taxation of uh, digital services and that whole sort of things to secure, uh, you know, government tax revenues. So you need all the existing uh, tools to work arguably better also in the future to combat inequality. But I do believe that without 
democratizing or spreading out the access to big data, you're going to uh, be dealing with a digitalization juggernaut that uh, you cannot control otherwise. Mm, yes, indeed. Thank you, Jacob. That's that, of course, is uh, it's interesting to see how the COVID-19 will play out, whether it will accelerate this uh, and, and, and what other forces will decelerate. But I see now there's a lot of questions coming in from our from our audience. Before I do that, can I just bring in the, the last of our, uh, certainly not least of our speakers, uh, also Lucille Spitt. Lucille, um, you know, it, do you think we can have a recovery that can be both green and fair to all? <laughs> Thank you, Maria, for this very simple question. Um, <laughs> <Indeed>. <laughs> what, what, what is interesting is that, as we all know, we are now in the second step of uh, coronavirus, the pandemic. And after the first uh, episode, uh, we were very glad to link uh, recovery with, uh, with green. And now with the second step, we know that we have to link recovery, green and social aspects. Because, uh, as it was said by Luis, uh, the question of inequalities, the fact that uh, the economic crisis is obviously uh, ma making uh, people already fragile more fragile is something which has been uh, really uh, documented by a lot of uh, statistic uh, uh, studies. For example, in France in October, uh, our national statistic offices show that a third of our, uh, a third of uh, French uh, uh, households uh, really had a, a, a strong decrease in their uh, in their income. So we know that we have to link social and green uh, issues. But I just wanted to, to to make three bullet points. The first one is that if we want to link these issues, social and green issues, we shouldn't take that for granted. I mean, very often when you listen to uh, to people in responsibilities, they seem to think that green issues are automatically uh, going to make more happiness for all of us, which of course is not the case. It was said by, I think it was said by uh, Luis or Jacob, I, um, or maybe uh, even Celine. The, the question is that making, uh, making economics become greener is of course a redistribution process and some sectors and some people are going to suffer more than others. So the question to take into account uh, to the uh, necessary extent, this question of tension between social and green issues is very important. You, everybody thinks of uh, the yellow jacket movement in France, which happened in 2018. And today we are in 2020, almost the end of the year. And we know that in France, uh, all the motivations and aspects that really created the yellow jacket movement are still there. So how can we link those two issues, social and green issues? I think it's really in front of us. And uh, the question of redistribution between member states, territories, people, sectors, is really something which should be uh, taken into account. The second thing I, I, I wanted to, to stress is that we should not, if we want to work on green and social issues at the same time, the same movement, we shouldn't oppose complexity, knowledge, and democracy. Uh, I think that each of us, uh, when, when speaking, is always pronouncing that term of democracy. But at the same time, we are, I think we are conscious that this, the, the things we are speaking of are very complex. Uh, our language, uh, our knowledge is really technical. So how can we manage, how can we, uh, can we do things so that we, we can link uh, popular deliberation, uh, making green a, a chance and an opportunity for the whole society, popular ecology, we say in France, and at the same time, uh, as, uh, as uh, Céline was saying, uh, develop the do not arm principle in Green Deal. So it's, it, it means that we should find some kind of common ground and common language between mm -hmm. things which are today very different, and that people who are really uh, living in very different world. Uh, I would give an example for it. When, when you think of uh, green issues, you think of public policies, and this is experts, technical vocabulary, and a specific agenda. But at the same time, you can speak about grassroots, uh, grassroots initiatives in local um, villages, having cooperatives, and what is interesting is that in these very local initiatives, very grassroots, 
the question of linking fairness and greenness is, some, is very often, I would say, a natural thing, something which happens spontaneously, which is not the same when we, we go into the world of government and of public policy. So how can we each other um, learn from uh, what's happening and how can we develop a common culture which is going to be a chance for democracy? This, this would be my second bullet point. And my third one, not to be too long, is uh, that it implies that uh, institutions should be more open. I think that uh, the link between what we call uh, counter institutions or checks and balances, uh, NGOs and uh, trade unions, the question of developing a real govern a common governance between people in institutions being responsible in these institutions and the people who today are considered as partners, but not at the same level, is certainly something which is uh, very important and, and very is going to be uh, the chance for uh, social and green issues to be linked. I think that what happened during the coronavirus crisis was very interesting because I think that in, at the European level, uh, you manage uh, to make uh, a lot of uh, uh, progress because you were talking with uh, uh, health, uh, health, health field act actors that you, you decided to get initiatives which were extraordinary. So in a way, what we could learn from this uh, coronavirus crisis is that we should try to find a governance which is not as normal and as, I would say, um, a daily governance, but something which is uh, sufficiently open and interactive so that we can link uh, grassroots initiatives, creativity, which comes from the civil society, and and the seriousness and financing which is in the institutions. Thank you very much, Lucille. You had a, a number of very important points. And actually, I think you are very much in line with, uh, with our audience. There's a number of questions that are coming in, and I can't help uh, feeling that I think what our audience is worried about is about the possible trade-offs between uh, a recovery, an economic recovery on, on the one hand, but a sustainable a sustainable one on the other. And the sustainable, I think there, there is, a, come, judging from the wording of the questions that are coming in, our, our audience is worried about long-term employment prospects, they're worried about social dislocation. I think um, in this second round, now that we've heard all your views, what I would like to do is I will give you the opportunity to perhaps react to these questions. And also I will try to uh, weld in the comments that are coming from our audience. And can I come back to Louise perhaps and start with you, Louise, and, and focus on exactly this trade-off. I'm going to call it a trade-off because you even mentioned it in your own uh, introductory remarks. The trade-off between uh, you know, wanting to green the economy, and quite frankly, I don't think we have a choice on the matter at this point, but I mean, you know, how do we do that? But also we ensure uh, that, you know, our population has jobs, uh, that the, the cost of this greening of the recovery is not borne uh, by certain uh, segments of the population, and disproportionately so. What are, what are the important principles for ensuring a fair recovery that will sustain employment? Thanks, Maria. This is really a, a, a very important question that, uh, that indeed goes beyond the current crisis. No, I think we've been all, um, and, 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 and people have been for many years you now asking themselves, you know, what is the cost of action um, in, uh, on, on the environment side uh, in terms of, uh, you know, economic activity that we may have to forego to achieve that. What, what we see is that those trade-offs are not as dramatic as sometimes they are portrayed. The, the economic effects of, for instance, having more stringent uh, regulations that protect uh, the environment, they tend to be, the, the negative effects tend to be on average uh, relatively small, even when sometimes the environmental impacts or the positive environmental impacts may be fairly large. But the issue is that those average effects mask lots of heterogeneity you know, across workers, across you know, individuals, across firms. Just to give you an idea of this heterogeneity across firms, work that, we've, that, we've, that we did um, uh, uh, some, a couple of years ago shows that uh, if you make regulations more stringent, so if you work uh, in a way that um, 
uh, tends to improve uh, the environment, the firms that are most penalized tend to be the low tech ones, the low tech ones, especially the ones operating in sectors uh, that are more intensive, that, that pollute more. So that in and of itself already shows you that there is a differentiated impact across firms, the ones that are more technologically advanced at high, higher productivity levels tend to have even increases in productivity as opposed to, as opposed to what people sometimes imagine to be a negative impact in terms of lo losses in, in, in productivity. So I would stress this fact that the negatives uh, may not be as high as people imagine on average, but they are indeed differentiated across sectors and across individuals. So that calls for some compensation. So uh, policies that would work towards, you know, more active labor market policies to help displaced workers find jobs, uh, training and retraining programs, design of social protection uh, uh, programs. All that is part of this policy package that could deal um, with protection for those that are most adversely uh, affected. One thing that you mentioned, Maria, that I think is very important, is that we tend to underestimate the cost of inaction, and that can be very high. So one thing about trade-offs, it's not only the cost of action, but the cost of inaction that we tend not to take on board. And when it comes to the cost of action, let's bear in mind that a lot of those costs have been coming down over time, uh, essentially as a result of innovation of technological progress. Just compare the price of batteries or the price of PV modules uh, 10 years ago and now. Modules are uh, 10 years ago, potential declines in the cost uh, of those uh, those tools, those elements, um, and that needs to be factored in as well. So technology can help a lot from that respect. Huh? But I would stress this fact that uh, um, uh, let's not overestimate sometimes the trade-offs, although we have to be mindful uh, of the uh, asymmetries that we see in those impacts. Thank you, Luis, also for the for your narrative, because I think what's important for the incredible transformations that we need to undergo uh, is societal buy-in. And I think it's important that the, 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 we sell this narrative in a most positive way in order to be able to achieve it. I think you, you've pitched it in a way that I think will be attractive for everybody to buy into this. Um, can I go back to perhaps uh, uh, Celine? Celine, uh, I mean, but through the nature of your position, I mean, I would like to to ask you uh, the the extent to which you know we are going to undergo a, a major public investments in the in the EU if we apply the recovery fund correctly, and you know how do we maximize that impact? And you know I think I would like you to touch on issues also of governance. How do we ensure that we monitor this so that we can interfere uh, as soon as we can in order to ensure productive uh, outcomes? And also there is also a question that is coming from our from our audience who are worried about the indebtedness that all of this is going to imply, not just this, but I mean, the pandemic itself has pushed countries into a huge uh, debt position. How do we ensure that the public can still remain an active player in this, but without necessarily mortgaging the future of our children in the future? Celine. Thank you very much. Um, well, first, and also to link to to, uh, to what we just heard from uh, from, from Luis, the this is an opportunity in terms of investment. When when we uh, the Commission, as as its first uh, policy initiative last year, uh, published its uh, its green, European Green Deal, uh, the, the the first finding was that there was a huge need for investment for investment into the green, but also for investment into the social to ensure this just uh, this just transition. So I really see this as, as an opportunity in a way to have the public investment contributing to delivering on that on that objective. But but to deliver on investment, you're absolutely right to point to the, to the need of, uh, of, of of proper governance and, and, and to the need of, of very robust uh, public administration. Uh, and, and these are things that we, we take extremely seriously to, to, to ensure that the investment will take place on the ground quickly and will bring jobs and results very, very quickly. So linking back to the European semester, which is the framework for the recovery and, and resilience facility, we will see that in many, many member states, in almost all of them, we have recommendations that look at two different relevant things. First, these are the bottlenecks for, for investment, both public and private investment. Uh, and second, uh, this is the administrative capacity of uh, of, of the uh, of the member states. 
So on the first aspect, on the um, on, on the bottlenecks, uh, we, we are looking together with the member states at the reforms that are needed in terms of public procurement, in terms of public-private partnership, but also in terms of control of, uh, of state aid and, and, and facilitation of, uh, of public authorization that are needed to deploy the, the investments. And the member states that, that have sometimes been a bit reluctant to implement this, uh, this, uh, these reforms now really see that if they want to be able to spend this money that they want to spend for the recovery, uh, they have to unblock this very, very quickly. Uh, and if you take, for example, the, um, Spain, uh, which, which traditionally had a very low absorption level for, for structural, so structural funds, we now really see uh, an intensive work going on to, to remove all of these administrative uh, bottlenecks to, to, to make sure that the investment touches the ground uh, very, uh, very quickly. Uh, the second aspect is, is obviously linked to, 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 to fraud, corruption and conflicts of interest. I think this is something that uh, nobody wants to see in the implementation of, uh, of, this, um, of this European facility. Uh, and and the, uh, the, the reforms uh, plans that of the member states are also here an opportunity to, to, to bring this, uh, this reforms through uh, and make sure that we will have public administrations that not only have the capacity, but also have uh, in place the mobile safeguards uh, to, to channel the, uh, the, uh, the investments uh, properly. And, uh, and finally, to answer your question on, uh, on in-depthness, uh, this is something that, that all the member states that had already a high level of debt are extremely, uh, extremely sensitive, uh, sensitive to. So the idea of uh, getting really the best uh, out of every uh, euro spent uh, and carrying out uh, spending reviews wherever necessary uh, is, is very much on the top of their, uh, of the, of their agenda. But also another element that they, they are looking at to ensure sustainability in the longer run uh, is how they can mobilize the private sector. And that's my last message. I think this investment needs uh, for sustainability are, are huge. They will not be made only by, by this public investment that we need, but also by mobilizing the private investment. And to mobilize private, uh, private investment, what we need is, is a proper uh, uh, regulatory framework. And here, uh, green finance uh, has, a, has a huge role to play. Uh, and is also a, a, a proper uh, state aid and competition framework to avoid that public investment is crowding out uh, private investment. We can't afford that. We need we need the best of of uh, of of, uh, of of both. We need to have to deploy all the private investment that is possible and only come with public uh, when we uh, when we have a market failure. And by targeting this public investment uh, right, we are also. Uh, limiting the, uh, the, the unnecessary uh, public spending and really uh, making the best of the public money we, we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Celine. Lots of, lots of very interesting things that I hope we can, uh, we can comment on. I will invite also the other panelists to react to each other's comments. But perhaps uh, we are halfway through our, our discussion. Why don't we take a, a minute to see how our audience actually thinks about the obstacles to sustainable recovery through the uh, the survey that we are running on SIDO. Um, can we see the results of, uh, of the question being asked? Okay, so the biggest obstacle to sustainable economic recovery is the dependence on fossil fuels is the first one. The lack of green finance, interesting. That is uh, the second one. Polarization uh, ties up. And then the last three ones is the lack of international government capacity poverty um, and uh, our public doesn't seem to worry too much about the increase in public debt as a way of providing for a sustainable economic recovery. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, half of our audience is, is arguing that the uh, it's, it's our real dependence on fossil fuel. So really what we need the most is technology that is going to move us away from these fossil fuels, renewable energy, things that are going to uh, decrease uh, this dependence. Can we perhaps then uh, discuss this a little bit further? Um, can I get back to you, Jakob? How, how do you see this, the obstacles to sustainable economic recovery? Do you agree with our audience? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think there are two aspects of dependence, uh, continuing dependence on fossil fuel fuels. Uh, I'm actually not sure that outside of, uh, you know, large sort of bulk shipping and obviously airlines, that it's the technology issue. Uh, because I think that uh, electric cars are now at a stage where uh, they are compatible. And, and what really, what the key is, uh, to me, is what is the price of carbon? 
uh, because I think, uh, you know, I, I don't actually agree with what Celine just said yeah, before, that there is a risk of crowding out uh, uh, in the current environment. The reality is that there are literally trillions of euros parked uh, in government securities yielding negative interest rates uh, that would love uh, to invest almost anywhere else, uh, uh, provided the right incentives. Uh, so I think the key to overcome a rapidly exiting uh, fossil fuels with much of the technology that we have. I'm not denying that there's going to be obviously a role uh, for continued innovation for sure. But the key point is you've got to have the investment incentives right. And that's what a, a you know, a broad based uh, higher carbon price uh, will do. Um, and uh, also, you know, on this issue of indebtedness, uh, again, um, you know, I think unless you can come up with a scenario where inflation returns uh, in the euro area uh, in the medium or even long term, uh, I think it's fair to say that interest rates will stay at or close to where they are now, which means that governments and other actors are going to be co facing continued the lowest uh, debt costs they uh, have faced, uh, you know, probably forever in a number of countries' cases. Uh, and as long as that's the case, I think the fixation on gross uh, debt to GDP levels is essentially a fallacy that reopens the opportunity for premature uh, reintroduction of, you know, austerity and the kind of like, which we know is going to you know, hurt first and foremost, the very public investments that we're trying to spur uh, to sustain the recovery, as well as the most vulnerable uh, members of society. Yeah, I think that you know, our audience agrees with you that the issue of indebtedness isn't really all that uh, problematic so long as interest rates are, are, are so low. But I think it's, it's also important to... Uh, to perhaps dig a little bit uh, deeper as to why they are so low is the reflection of something something else going on. And you know, when I talked about innovation, I didn't so much meant the issue of invention. I think we have the technology that we mean, and of course we will always have space for new inventions. But innovation is much more than just the invention. I mean, very, you take the invention and you put it into profitable positions, you scale it up, that's the innovation. So, you know, finance comes into this. And this is where I think uh, Celine's point also was about the private-public interaction. Do we have the right conditions for the private to be involved? And and perhaps we, we, can, we can come back to this if you don't mind, uh, um, Jacob, but I would like to bring also Lucille into this conversation. Lucille, do you follow the, do you agree with the priorities that our, our public has uh, has identified and how do you see that? Thank you, Maria. I don't have them in front of me. And I, 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 my, my first remark would be that you could choose uh, several answers. Uh, so, I mean, it's not 1%. I mean, you could say uh, foresight fuels and then uh, choose uh, polarization, for example, or, or debt. And uh, what is interesting is that I feel that lots of these, uh, lots of the preoccupations are quite high. I mean, you don't have a f 5%. And uh, so it means that. Uh, most of us feel that it's a multifactorial uh, approach uh, that explains that uh, obstacles are still there uh, when you want to organize a green transition or a more sustainable uh, society. Or So that's interesting, it's multifactorial. And then you go back to what Celine was saying about the fact that if you want to realize that green transition, you should always associate actors uh, who, uh, which belong to a uh, public and private sector territories and national uh, uh, scale, uh, European and, and, and worldwide uh, uh, negotiations. So that's interesting to, to see that um, our audience understands this complexity, this complex scheme we are facing. Uh, the second thing uh, which really interests me is this, uh, uh, I remember that there were 28% 20, uh, on poverty, and I think that um, today, that question of, uh, we were talking about social inequalities is really very prominent. And especially because you might make the link between the question of youth and the question of inequalities and the question of the vision of the future. Because if we want to have a, a greener uh, society, if we want to have a more resilient and more sustainable world, we need to uh, envisage, we need to define uh, our future differently. That's very important. 
And we know that this question has been really uh, taken into account by uh, young people. We know that Ursula von der Leyen, as the president of the commission, she really deeply insisted on that. It was very, very political uh, aspect of, his, of her different speeches uh, about Green Deal. And I think that it shows very well that we should really articulate uh, link this social aspects and this question of um, uh, envisaging uh, structuring our future. Uh, I would insist on poverty if I had something to insist on. Um, I think 28% is it's a good percentage, but I would have liked it to be higher because I feel that poverty and polarization are linked. Today, it's very difficult when you ask somebody to find a common ground and a common project when you want to uh, envisage, when you want to imagine what could be a greener society. Uh, some, some would say uh, it's bicycle, others would say it's food, others would say uh, it's just um, getting rid of uh, fossil fuels. Uh, but um, it's, it's, of course, it's a whole thing which could be, uh, which should be structured. And today, we don't, we, we still not have uh, that uh, society project, which would uh, include everybody. So I think this is uh, what I would uh, say from these uh, preferences from our audience. Thank you very much, Lucille. Uh, I'm aware that we, that we are not have much time anymore, but I would like to for us to touch and I invite you all four to comment on the two following issues. One is the, the greening of finance. There's also a question coming in from from our audience, you know, the private investments, how do we ensure that private investments are ex exclusively dedicated on sustainability efforts? So can you comment a little bit on how do we develop the markets uh, for green finance and what, what kind of things do we need to put in place? There is a wonderful uh, study done, uh, well, actually there are many now that are showing that there is a thirst for green finance uh, coming from the investor side, but how do you make sure that there are enough projects to sustain this and therefore that the scale that we need for visible results is there. So that's one. And the second one that I'd like to comment on, and we haven't talked this uh, at all uh, today, but I think it's, it's an important component, is the, the, the global environment. Uh, we have the new US administration, possibly the priorities will change, will they? And if they are, if they do, uh, in what in what direction? But also the role of China here, both as a, as a driver, as as part of the engine of growth, but also uh, as a, as one of the countries that is committed to the green transition. So two things here: the green finance. How do we create the markets? And then, how do you see the multilateral framework, the global framework, the global economy? cooperating or not cooperating on the things that we need to do with that if you want to comment on so if you know carbon border tax or on the carbon pricing and these will be very important variables for our uh, for our conversation uh, who would like to go first uh, maria if you if you allow me um i i could make a point about the uh, the carbon pricing uh, issue that was raised before yeah because I find it really uh, timely uh, in the light of, of the point I made before about the level of, uh, pri of uh, fossil fuel prices right now. You know? So if we go really through an extended period of substantially lower fossil fuel prices, then what that uh, means is that we need to think of stronger incentives for firms to invest in energy efficient technologies. Now, and carbon pricing does exactly that. It would allow, allow us to have a better alignment of these long term price signals uh, with environmental objectives, uh, but also, you know, to reduce um, environmental policy uncertainty, even to improve the prospects for funding uh, of longer term investments in clean technology. I think this is important because it's about price signals, it's about alignment of, uh, alignment of policies, and it's about uh, funding for the investments um, that you mentioned uh, uh, before. Uh, there are, for instance, interesting cases where that, uh, where that alignment comes, uh, comes into play. To take, for instance, um, energy efficiency in buildings uh, in, in our uh, in our societies, you know, buildings are responsible for a lot of the emissions. Uh, in, on average, if you take uh, among OECD countries, it's about a fifth of total CO2 emissions come from businesses, uh, from sorry, from buildings and, and, and structures. So that's an area where creating incentives for investment in energy efficiency. So to tie in with the point of investment that you made. 
Um, and at the same time, you know, make sure that uh, the people who live in buildings, in, in, in houses, in dwellings, for instance, that are least energy efficient, that tend to be the poorer segments of society, the ones that tend to spend more out of their relative income on energy than others, that they have really the means to upgrade uh, the uh, energy efficiency of their buildings. But for that, we need finance. So it's, it's a beautiful area where um, the affordability consideration, the inequality consideration that you mentioned meets the sustainability consideration through the funding side, right? So there is a missing market there. You know, how can we invest in something that would reduce energy poverty, that would create opportunities for investment in green uh, technologies uh, uh, that will, you, you know, create jobs even. Uh, and so it's, it's an area where I think signaling through prices, uh, aligning policy objectives and concretely investing in areas where the payoffs of policy action um, can be relatively quick um, are areas where there are win-wins uh, in all along all those uh, uh, dimensions that we've been talking about. Thank you very much, Luis. I think the, uh, the the research for the future is going to be how we can credibly commit to the carbon price, and so that, as you say, we come into the the signaling that we the right signal for for the market to develop. Uh, was it Jakob who wanted to uh, to uh, say something or two questions on green finance and then the international environment? I mean, I think ultimately yeah. on the issue of, of getting to scale in green finance, uh, it's very clear, as you mentioned, there is obvious demand from uh, investors for, you know, green financial assets. So the real issue there in some ways is decide, you know, it's ultimately about deciding what is green, right? I mean, is nuclear power, investment in nuclear power, is that green? Uh, yes, some would say yes, some would say no. Uh, uh, but it, I, I think that's really, uh, uh, you know, the, probably the most contentious element of that, because clearly demand is there, uh, no doubt about it. On the international environment, uh, you know, I think it's very clear that the new Biden administration in the United States will move very aggressively on uh, <clears throat> on climate uh, in the United States and will have a lot of help not necessarily from the potentially still uh, Republican U.S. Senate, but from many uh, U.S. Uh, state governments. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, I certainly believe that Europe will have a partner there. And obviously, Biden is going to uh, go back into the um, you know, Paris Accord on day one, as he has mentioned. A uh, bigger issue, of course, is China, the world's biggest emitter. Uh, it was clearly a big uh, step forward that, that uh, President Xi committed to 2060. Um, but at the same time, uh, uh, you know, policymaking in China is, is trickier than that because you know, everyone knows that China continues to build a lot of fossil fuel power plants and indeed export them also as you know, part of Belt and Road and, and other initiatives to other countries. So uh, how is China going to achieve this? Um, you know, there's obviously going to be uh, a lot of a, a lot of domestic reform needed, uh, and I think there a, a key issue with regarding China is that without a doubt, given the 2060 commitment, the Chinese market is going to be by far the biggest market for green technology uh, in the decades ahead, uh, which of course means that uh, influencing Chinese regulation on these issues. Uh, will be crucial because otherwise uh, market size will dictate that it, it's actually Chinese standards that risk becoming global uh, rather than say European or American ones. You've touched on many big issues there. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into this. Lucille, you wanted to make an intervention to this specific issue? Following what Jacob said, I think that uh, uh, the question of the role European Union can play in international negotiation is very interesting because I think that Green Deal as an example, and, and that's something which is completely unique today, uh, might really reinforce and strengthen uh, the position of European Union and member states during these negotiations. And the second thing I would say about European Union in this COP, uh, the future COP, of course, is that we should be a link between uh, poor countries and countries already uh, suffering from uh, 
the question of adaptation to uh, the uh, uh, climate change. And uh, I don't think that United States can play this role. I mean, they have, first of all, to recover their own seat. And the question of China is, of course, green technology and decision to planify, uh, to plan a green technology, it's okay. But the question of democracy and making the link with uh, green issues is really uh, a, key, uh, a key problem in China because we know that on the health issues, for example, lots of Chinese people have suffered from things, pollution and uh, industrial <coughs> catastrophes. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say about investment is that Céline was saying that the do not arm principle is uh, fundamental. I think that public uh, policies is important in evaluating what um, private sector is doing in investment because we know that we have a real division between firms and it was very clear in April between firms wanting to say that green deal shouldn't be linked to recovery and other firms who said which said they wanted it to be to be linked so we have to to have alliances and we have to play our role as public actors to uh, evaluate and uh, and apply this do not arm principle Thank you very much, uh, Lucille. I'm very aware to hear that we have only three minutes left. So why don't I turn to the order that we of the presenters and ask them if you can give us your final thoughts to answer the question that we were posing in this panel, which is how can we build a sustainable economic recovery post coronavirus? If you could give us your thoughts in one or two sentences, that would be very much appreciated. And I start with you, Salim. So thank you. One minute. Um, as also, yes, it can be reconciled. Yes, it has to be reconciled. So European Green Deal uh, work or uh, growth agenda for the crisis. It has to be uh, a growth agenda, not only because the climate, the necessity of addressing climate change has not diminished with the, with the crisis, but also because it makes a lot of sense uh, in terms of, uh, of economic and social uh, development. So yes, both can be reconciled and should be reconciled. Thank you. Perhaps I can move on to Luis with your final statement, Luis. Thanks, Maria. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity that we have to address these challenges that are related to the current crisis, but also the ones that existed and were with us even before. That will require careful policy making, and that will also require very good communication to make sure that the public opinion is with, it, is with us. Uh, and for that, I think a careful balance between what we can achieve, uh, what we can do to compensate those that will, who will be most adversely affected as well, where negative uh, uh, impacts uh, can be uh, expected and will be also part uh, of this uh, collective buy-in. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, Jakob? Uh, yeah, very quickly. I mean, my I think my, my basic two policy levers to uh, have both, uh, if you like, Digital sustainability, green sustainability is really, uh, as was already mentioned, carbon pricing. Uh, so continue to expand uh, the scope of uh, European carbon pricing, preferably, uh, of course, also at the global level. Uh, that is key. Uh, and continue to commit to uh, continue to raise prices in the future to the uh, point where obviously it's no longer sustainable to use uh, carbon fuels. And then, uh, as I already discussed, uh, it is, in my opinion, absolutely critical uh, for uh, Europe and indeed the rest of the world to figure out how to share uh, the big data sets that digitalization will continue to uh, you know, make available for uh, at least some actors and how to make sure that everybody has access to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob. And finally, Lucille, a final thought. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I, I, would, I just wanted to say that I think that our dialogue in its diversity, I mean, some of us were talking about carbon, do not arm principle, public policies, society, poverty. It shows the way we should organize that society project by the diversity of points of view, languages, and I would say even competencies. So I think that uh, thank you very much for this dialogue. I feel that it's the beginning of uh, this more resilient uh, society we want to, to make. Thank you so much. There are a lot of very interesting things, opportunities, balancing policies to compensate for equitable distributions, a multilateral environment that is perhaps more conducive to uh, cooperation, even at 
phone prices, as we heard from, from Jacob, and finally exploiting the diversity that will provide for resilience to our society. A lot of very important messages there, I say, big messages. I hope we have it in us uh, to meet the challenges that we, come, uh, that we have ahead. But first of all, uh, I wish you all, uh, I thank you all for participating. And first of all, stay, stay well, stay healthy, and we see you in hopefully some other event. Thank you very much, and thank you to our viewers for participating.